So we're going to do our last uh, modality that we're going to study today. Uh, and x-ray angiography, or sometimes called x-ray fluoroscopy, is the uh, name of the modality. And it's one of the most commonly used uh, modalities in cardiology. Um, probably SPECT, you know, the number of SPECT scans is probably higher because at one time 10 million SPECT scans were being done a year. I think probably a million coronary angiograms are done a year in the United States, something like that. Uh, so it's, it's a big uh, uh, business and uh, a large application. So x-ray imaging at its core is pretty simple. Uh, pictures look something like this, and the, and, you know, the brightness here corresponds to uh, attenuation of x-rays. And so this is an inverted image. Uh, the bones obviously are basically attenuating the x-rays more than the soft tissue. Uh, and so you see a, a greater uh, signal intensity here. If you zoom in, you can see extraordinary extraordinarily uh, resolution, right? So resolution is usually measured in line pairs per millimeter on fluoroscopy or, or x-ray imaging. Um, it has very high in-plane resolution, but very low through-plane resolution. So if the imaging plane is x and y and the slice or the volume direction is z, this is a projection through the volume, and it's the accumulation, just like in CT, of the attenuation that occurs through that volume. Now, when you have objects that, you know, are quasi two-dimensional, such as a hand, right, then you can see these fantastic details, and so you would see very hairline fractures and, and you know, the beginning of arthritis and things like that. Does anybody know if that's the right or the left hand? Is there any way to tell? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to tell. If you could figure out a way to tell, uh, shoot me an email, because I haven't figured it out, right? Because it could be like that one hand this way or, or this way, right? So I don't really know. Maybe there's an asymmetry in there that, that gives it away, but. So this is what a fluoroscopy lab looks like. Uh, it's, it's not like a surgical suite that has to be um, absolutely uh, sort of sanitized and sort of at a high level and germ-free. And in, for example, in an OR, you have a positive pressure ventilation. So, so basically all the air exits the room after it comes through highly filtered uh, um, inputs. These rooms are clean, but they're not like surgical suites. You can walk in and out of this thing and, and do functional stuff. Um, the basic components of the room are pretty simple. You have a table upon which the patient lies down here, and you can, you can tilt the table, you can rotate it a little bit, and you can drive it backwards and forwards underneath the x-ray beam. So you can pan as you're taking your images. And the panning is usually slightly motor assisted and so you just hit a basically a joystick and the table will move one way or the other. While images are being obtained there in real time, they're shown on a large screen in front of the physician. Uh, the hemodynamics of the patient are also shown. So the EKG, uh, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, things like that, so you know how the patient's doing. And then up here you can have ancillary data such as a CT scan that was obtained earlier or uh, some other data that you want to see. This unit is a, a contrast injection unit, and so if you want a very controlled injection of contrast, you can use this pump to do that. Uh, and then there's a cabinet back, there's a bunch of cabinets in these rooms, these stainless steel cabinets, 
And inside those cabinets are many, many tools that are, uh, you know, packed in, in uh, hermetically sealed containers uh, that you crack open and use to do some kind of intervention, right? And most of them are catheters. Most of them are long, sort of stringy catheter things that you put in the patient and to squirt something in or to measure something. Each time someone reaches into that cabinet and pulls one of those boxes out that the physician asks for and opens it up, it's usually like a thousand bucks or, or something like that, or in some cases it's ten thousand dollars if it's a really sophisticated instrument, right? Um, so the cases, uh, you know, there's an interesting balance between using a lot of equipment to do a case, right? versus taking a simpler route to get the case done in terms of the cost benefit of, of that uh, procedure. But usually the physician doesn't worry about that. They just ask for the device they want. So this is what that same place looks like when a case is underway. And this is obviously an interesting case because there's so many darn people hanging around looking at what's going on. Um, so there, you've got probably three physicians here talking about what they should do next, looking at the, the screen, deciding what, you know, how, how they should proceed at this point. Um, there's uh, a nurse in the back who's trying to turn on some, some device. This person here is likely a representative from a company. And when you're using complex devices in interventional procedures, oftentimes there's a representative from the company standing there giving you advice. Because, you know, all of the, the essentially secret sauce of how to use that device properly comes from experience. And so if you have no experience and you're starting to use this thing, you need somebody there to help you. And so this is every company like Boston Scientific, Medtronic, you name them, all have these reps who spend all of their days in cath labs, and in interventional labs, talking physicians through using devices. And it's an interesting philosophy. Um, they obviously don't want those devices used improperly and causing harm, and so that's one reason they're there. And the other is just to get everybody up to speed as fast as possible. Um, a completely different tactic is taken by the medical imaging industry in which you buy a $2 million scanner and they put it in and one of these people comes for four days and teaches somebody how to use it and then they disappear forever. Right? So you're just left with this machine and you figure out how to use it. And it's, it's a completely different philosophy. I mean, it's harder to, to do harm with a, a non-interventional machine, and so there's, there's low risk involved. But I do think it would, the medicine would be a lot better if the companies had representatives there also training people how to do non-invasive imaging. So one of these cases, this could be, for instance, installing or implanting a device that closes off the left atrial appendage, right? So you have this left atrial appendage and it, it can develop thrombus, so you want to close that off. And they have a new device that you can use as, with a catheter under fluoro and you push it in there, open it up like an umbrella and just leave it there, right? And so the, this is called a Watchman device and interventional labs across the country have been putting these things in at higher and higher numbers. So any questions about what's going on here? Now we'll, we'll look at the imaging equipment itself. Um, oh, first, yeah. So here's the, the dynamic screen. And then during an injection of a contrast agent, this is what the image looks like. This device here is a catheter that's been inserted in the femoral artery and brought up around the aortic arch down into the aortic root, which is right here, and then plugged in to the left main coronary artery, and then dye is injected, producing these absolutely spectacular pictures. 
right? These are great. It's hard to beat these, you know, in terms of just spatial resolution and detail, right? Oh, sorry, let me pause that. Uh, so obviously the reason why the image is so clear is because the, the object itself is essentially, you know, uh, it's a 3D tube, but the tube isn't, isn't that deep, and so you, a projection is a very good representation of that object. There are, cert, there are places where it breaks down, right? They're here, where you have a number of vessels that are overlapping each other, it becomes very confusing. You can't really see what's going on in any of these vessels, except maybe the one on the top uh, at this location. And so you need to angle the x-rays from a different viewpoint to image the entire volume. This is the diaphragm here. This is the lung volume up here. You can see the shadow of ribs here. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at how these dynamic images are, are obtained. I'm not sure, did we do as a problem set, did we look at the edge of one of these vessels and try and figure out the spatial resolution? I don't think we did, right? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's worth while I think there's some of these cast images are on the website, like bringing these things up in an image J, zooming in and actually looking at what you feel the spatial resolution is of this technique. It looks fantastic from here, but when you get in close and you say, all right, now that small vessel here, how far can I see it? And then, you know, what is the dimension of, of the vessel across here? When you get right down to the, the point spread function level of single pixels, it, you know, you get a feel for what the resolution actually is. But for major features of the coronary arteries, this is a great imaging technique. So here's the device itself. Remember, the patient is lying on a table here. And um, this is called an image intensifier. And this is the x-ray source. And so we're going to produce x-rays here. They'll come out just like an x-ray flashlight, shine them through the patient, and then the shadow is cast on this, the x-ray shadow is cast on this detector. This is an old fluoroscopy system uh, in the sense that uh, this grid here, and then there's, a, there's a, a layer in which when the x-ray comes in, it causes a flash of light, uh, just like on a, a fluoroscopy screen, like a television. And, um, and then that light is detected by the optical components of the system up here. So it's basically a camera looking at this, the image that's being created by the real-time flashes of light from the x-rays. The x-ray generator uh, makes a, a large voltage between, and we'll, we'll see the internals of an x-ray tube in a second, it makes a large voltage and produces current uh, so that uh, the x-ray tube can have an electron beam that hits a target that makes x-rays. Uh, there's a collimation here so that the x-ray beam that's coming out is is collimated, so it's just hitting the patient. It's not sort of zooming all over the room. And um, so it goes through the patient and hits this, this target. Uh, the reason it's called a fluoroscope is because this was fluorescence, right? The, the detection was fluorescence. Nowadays, this detector is usually a solid state x-ray detector, right? And so it's, you don't have this fluoroscope stuff. Making one of these work beside an MRI scanner was, was an interesting project we did about 15 years ago. Because an MRI scanner has uh, a magnetic field here, which bent the path of the electrons as they hit the, the fluoroscopy uh, unit. And so the whole thing gets, sort of gets distorted. And you have to undistort it somehow or shield it. So let's look at. This is a really important component of x-ray imaging, both for fluoroscopy and for CT, is the x-ray tube. Uh, it's essentially a light bulb in the sense that it's inside a vacuum, so you have a glass tube, and it's about this big. You can hold it in your hands. And uh, you evacuate the air 
right? So that we have a relative vacuum in here. This spinning anode, this is a disc looked on, we're looking sidelong along the disc. And so the radius of the disc is this, and it, it spins for, to distribute heating. And that's the anode. And the cathode, or the negative uh, component here, is just like a filament that is, like a lot of current is put through that filament, and it boils off electrons, essentially. And those electrons are accelerated across a voltage. So if this is a positive, if the voltage difference from here is positive, the, the electrons will shoot across the gap and hit the target. And so that's how we make x-rays, is the it's called Bremsstrahlung, essentially, radiation of an electron going into this metal and being accelerated down, right? And shoots off x-rays as that occurs. You can also eject electrons in uh, the target itself out of their orbitals, and then as other electrons replace them, you will get x-rays emitted from, from the target. So a polyenergetic x-ray source uh, this, this produces x-rays that have different energies, okay? Um, and those energies are dependent pretty well on the interaction of these electrons with uh, the target. The way you control um, the energy of the x-rays is you change the voltage between the anode and the cathode. And if we crank the voltage up to 140 kilovolts, then the electrons will be going faster when they hit the target and they'll produce x-rays that have higher energy right, and a shorter wavelength. And most of diagnostic imaging is done in this energy range between 70 to 140 kilovolts. And the absorption of x-rays by the human, by the human body, uh, differs substantially from 70 to 140 kilovolts. 70 kilovolt x-rays get absorbed much more readily than 140k and so you get different contrast mechanisms depending on the energy so uh, all of the mechanics here uh, basically are to rotate this disc such that the electrons are hitting a much broader target over time so that you're not depositing energy just in, at one spot on the target because it would just burn up or get really hot. Okay. And then the other thing we can change is we can crank up the current, which is essentially the number of electrons that are flying across the gap. And if I double the MA, the current here, then I will get twice as many x-rays coming out. That's essentially it. So if I if I want to make a higher signal-to-noise x-ray picture, I can just crank up the MA and put more x-rays through the patient. Right? And I'll get a, a, a brighter x-ray uh, beam. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Oh, I should have flipped this one around, actually. Um, in real life, I should have put a nickel on the table. Oh, this is my, my picture. A nickel would be about this big. And here, this is the anode, and the cathode is right here, and so the uh, you know, electron beam's coming across this way. And this little motor housing is, is just to spin this anode. Okay, so the two things we can change on our system, on our fluoroscopy system, we have, we have like dials that we're going to change to change the imaging. Uh, one is the KV, which is the energy of the, the beam itself and the wavelength of the beam. And the other is MA, which is just strictly the number of photons that are going to come out. Right. So if we set the, the KV to, say, 90, then the highest energy photon that we're going to see will, ha will be a 90 KEV x-ray. However, the, the spectrum that's going to come out of this uh, x-ray light bulb, uh, when, you, when you look at the physics of how those electrons interact with, with the matter, 
uh, the spectrum itself looks something like this. This basically it's just a straight line where you have higher numbers of low energy x-rays coming out than high energy x-rays. We won't go into the, all the physics of how this spectrum is generated from the, the target. The very low energy x-rays when they uh, are emitted uh, from the target are immediately absorbed basically by either the target itself so they're emitted deep inside the target and they can't get out right uh, or the glass housing right and so the, the beam that's coming out has an initial filtration where you lose a lot of these low energy x-rays and and that's a good thing because those x-rays would not this, you know, contribute to any contrast in your image. They would all get absorbed by the patient. And so there'd be no differential absorption to produce a picture on your detector behind the patient. They'd all just hit the patient and stay in the patient. And the, all they would produce is a higher dose to the patient. And so they get filtered out. And in fact, you can actively filter using copper or aluminum or some thin strip of metal if we put it you know when the x-rays are coming out here we collimate them and then we put a thin strip of metal here such that we change the energy spectrum of the x-rays coming out to weight the energy spectrum towards higher energies um, that way we get rid of those low energies that don't create contrast but do create dose most of the time, as we saw with CT, when you're doing the mathematical modeling of the uh, X-ray imaging and X-ray spectrum, you just take the mean of this distribution and you say, I'll, I'll compute what my image will look like if I assume all of the photons had that mean energy. Um, that causes some artifacts in images, that assumption. Uh, they're not huge unless the objects that are absorbing the x-rays you know are really dependent on energy and so that, that can happen with metal and certain things and so um, sometimes you need to actually do a full energy spectrum reconstruction most of the time not um, So as we change the dial on our x-ray tube from 60 to 80 to 100 to 120 kV is our maximum energy, uh, this is the difference in the spectrum that we achieve. And so you see that as if I put in 120 kV, I also get a much higher number of lower energy photons. And so uh, when you're clicking up in KV, you're not only just, you know, it's not, it's not scaled such that you get the same number of photons over a broader range of energy than when you have 60 KV. Just the fluence goes up as well of, of photons just by clicking the KV up. And so uh, the energy, I mean, you've got these electrons that are flying across the gap now at, at a higher energy because the voltage is higher you know that energy the total energy in that electron beam is reflected in the total number of photons that are coming out of that target and so you just see more photons right? um, so when when you're looking at signal to noise and you say oh what's my signal to noise at 120 kV versus 80 kV and it increases considerably at 120 kV Part of the reason is you just have a lot more photons uh, hitting you, going through the patient. Okay, so in terms of changing the number of photons at a specific voltage, so oftentimes now we image at these lower KVPs of 80 kV because the dose to the patient is a lot lower and so it would be nice to make pictures just with these low energy x-rays. Uh, when you crank up the MA, 
to achieve a, a higher number of photons, it, it's just a linear process here with, with the MA. And essentially now the, the demand from the manufacturers is to produce X-ray tubes that can give you a lot of photons when you set the KVP to a low energy. And so that, that was not achievable until about five years ago, four, three years ago even, with these new, new generation of X-ray tubes where you wanted to set the KVP to 80 and then you went to adjust the MA and it would only go so far. It would only go to 200 or something. Now you have X-ray tubes that will go to 1200 MA at 80 KVP. And so you just get a heck of a lot more photons at these lower energies. And so imaging is moving down on the energy scale with the number of photons being conserved by making X-ray tubes that can actually achieve that. Okay? Uh, so that's part of the race in the, the business of both CT scanners and fluoroscopy scanners is how do I make a huge photon fluence at a, at a lower energy. So there's an interesting geometric uh, relationship uh, that is produced by the basically the geometry of the target. And uh, recall that the x-ray tube, the anode is this disc. Here's our cathode in the and the electrons are going to go across this air gap and hit the target over here. So the, the target itself has um, an area from which the x-rays emanate and um, it's, it's defined, it's called the focal spot or the spot size and, that, and in, on that rectangle, say it looks like this, you know Basically, the electrons are hitting the target you know, in this rectangular region. If we tried to focus the electrons down so that they only em were emitted from a point, a mathematical point, which from an imaging standpoint would, would be great because you just have this point source, but from a physics and engineering standpoint, it's not good because you have an infinite energy you know, density at that point. And so you need to spread out the or make a larger area from which the x-rays emanate. And it's, it's a 3D volume, right? The, the electrons will go to a certain depth inside the target and x-rays will come out. So this spot on the x-ray source itself is a source of blurring in the images. The fact that the the uh, x-rays come from an area as opposed to a point. When you calculate what the image of a point is, right? if I have a, uh, let's just assume I had a point right here and I looked at its image on, my, on the shadowgram, the fact that I have an area emanating my x-rays makes that point blur because you're looking at the point from slightly different angles at different points on this spot, right? So this is a source of blurring, this spot size. And so you'd like to make it as small as possible, but you don't want to burn up your target. The other thing that happens is that when you project, because this is at an angle, right, uh, you want to project the, the photons emanating here from a, an area and that projects down say at the center as an image of the spot at this angle so it projects down as something like looks like a square the long end is is uh, shortened by the geometry and it looks like a square at, at this point in the field of view right we see that the spot size itself looks like a much larger object, right? Because when we, we look back, the projection of the, the length actually is longer at our, at our detector. Similarly, as we move you know, behind the anode, uh, they get shorter. And so we get this distortion of the spot size 
as a function of position on our detector. So that's one source of um, artifact in the, in the images. And this happens both, remember, in CT and in fluoroscopy, right? Because they're, they're both using an X-ray source and projecting that X-ray source onto a detector uh, and the casting a shadow here. So the standard spot sizes nowadays in uh, X-ray tubes are on the order of 0.7 millimeters on a side to 1.2 millimeters on a side, somewhere in there, 1.5. And if you have a really large patient and you need to get a lot of X-rays out of your X-ray tube in order to get X-rays through the patient to the detector, normally you have to go to a larger spot size in order to get that fluence of x-rays to get through the patient. So you drop down in your potential image resolution because the spot size gets bigger when you need more x-rays. Okay. So if you want to do high resolution imaging, you make the spot size as small as possible. Okay. You can actually, there's simple ways of, of figuring out what the spot size is uh, the simplest is to actually take some tin foil or, you know, an, a really flat foil thing, put a pinhole in it, and then stick it in your scanner, and then you can actually make, like a pinhole camera, an image of the focal spot. Okay. And that will tell you precisely what the shape is of the focal spot on your x-ray tube, uh, if you have your doubts. And... Um, you know, the manufacturer will tell you what their focal spot size is, uh, but if you want to val validate that, uh, you're, you can make a pretty simple picture and take a look at it. The other interesting effect of having a, a target that looks like this, so remember this is one half of the rotating anode, this is the radius here, it's a disk. Uh, the electron beam from the cathode is coming across here, hitting our spot size, which is a rectangle on the anode. When we look at the intensity of x-rays that hit the target or hit our detector, for example, with nothing in the field of view, let's say we just scan air. So there should be no attenuation of x-rays between our generation of the x-ray and the detector you'll see a significant variation in the intensity across your detector from an effect called the heel effect. And what the heel effect is, is if I have an x-ray that is produced at my target, here my anode target, and it comes off of the target closer to a perpendicular trajectory than say this way, it doesn't have to go through much target to get out. Right? However, if my x-ray is going to come out this way and it's a few microns in, and it's created a few microns inside this target, on its way out it has a higher probability of being absorbed by the target itself. Right? So there's this differential attenuation of x-ray fluence as a function of angle where that angle is, is the angle you know, from the tangent to our, our uh, target surface. And that's called the heel effect. And this is pretty significant. When you look at, you know, when we just take images on the CT scanner of air and then look at the raw data itself, you see a significant brightness variation on the detector from this effect. So that has to be taken into account when you're reconstructing images with CT or you're looking at a fluoroscopy system and you want to measure some kind of quantitative brightness. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are systems uh, not only... Uh, there, there are systems right now that are, are being designed where you have multiple x-ray sources around the patient and simultaneously getting views at, at different locations. Now, trying to get rid of this effect, I mean, there's, there's probably a smarter way 
to make an anode that has some kind of surface geometry, perhaps, that, that would perhaps nullify this effect, but that's, that hasn't been looked at, as far as I know. Everybody just deals with it, you know? But I, I'm sure you could, you could make an, a better geometry anode, right? So, um, in terms of spatial resolutions that is observed with these systems, as I was saying before, it's, it's pretty high. Uh, so if you have a flat panel array that's like an X-ray detector array, and um, uh, you, you essentially set your field of view uh, in, in the system to, to image a, a particular field of view in the object, and we can do that, remember, by, by just moving the object with respect to the x-ray source and the detector. So I have a source and a detector. If I move my object towards the source, what happens to its image on the detector? So I have a flashlight here. My hand is here, and my shadow of my hand is on the wall. As I move my hand towards the flashlight, what happens to the shadow? It's bigger, right? It magnifies. So in exactly the same way, on a fluoroscopy system, you can decide what sort of magnification you're going to work at just by changing the relative position of the x-ray source and the detector. Right? So uh, this is the, the types of resolution that is achieved uh, when you're, you're going through those uh, settings. And you can see we're, we're getting up to like three and a half line pairs per millimeter. Right? So it's pretty, pretty fine resolution. And uh, here's a, you know, the phantom that you would put onto the, the system uh, to test whether or not you were achieving the, those line pairs per millimeter. Uh, looks like this. And we looked at these before. So here's some, you know, basic uh, resolution measurements uh, on a on a typical angiography system. Okay, when you change your field of view. So in the heart during, um, you know, coronary angiography, we're somewhere around three line pairs per millimeter in terms of in-plane resolution. Uh, in, in the same way that we did this with CT, uh, you can put a simple phantom in your fluoroscopy system that changes the uh, amount of contrast uh, in a region, and uh, you, know, you can look at different sizes of uh, objects and different contrasts uh, versus uh, signal-to-noise, and uh, when you, and that defines sort of a, a range over which, a, basically a signal to noise range and a contrast range that you can detect uh, with your system. And this is the same type of contrast resolution that we talked about in CT. Um, and, uh, you know, you can measure it quite simply with a phantom like this, step phantom. So the real reason why the fluoroscopy system produces amazing looking pictures is the fact that each picture is not an, an integration of x-ray absorption over some time, some continuous time. So if I had uh, you know, a continuous x-ray source and I measured uh, my, my image and integrated uh, the number of x-rays or the contrast that I detect, say, every 30 milliseconds. And I, I could make pictures from that continuous source, take this time here, average those together, and make a picture, then average these together, make a picture. I'd get 30 frames per second at a certain x-ray fluence. But with modern x-ray tubes, 
we can actually get much higher flux of x-rays out of that tube. And so the way most modern fluoroscopy systems work, this is you know, up till about 15 years ago, look like this, where the same number of x-ray photons required to get a certain signal to noise are shot out of the x-ray tube and through the patient, but it all happens you know, in a few milliseconds. So you turn the x-rays on and then turn them right back off again. So the patient is not being irradiated during this period. And you have a picture right? that, yes, they're coming out at 30 frames a second, but the shutter speed for that picture is not 1 over 30 frames per second, right? It's 1 over 8 milliseconds. So you get these really clear um, high shutter speed x-ray photographs that you page out at whatever frame rate you want. Right? And most interventions are done here at fit around 15 frames a second. And, you know, and nowadays you can, 8 milliseconds is long, you can even make shorter uh, bursts of x-rays. And so that brings the dose, uh, or keeps the dose where it was up here, but you're getting these much clearer pictures. Um, the other thing that is used, uh, much like in magnetic resonance with gadolinium DTPA and with CT with iodinated contrast agents, you can use contrast agents in fluoroscopy, the same ones that you use in CT. And in this case, uh, barium is used and it has a really high absorption uh, at this particular energy and so it shows up as a very absorptive uh, substance. And this poor devil here is gonna drink what is essentially has the consistency of a really thick milkshake, but it has this barium stuff in it, barium sulfate, and you drink that down, and then you can image your gut very accurately as, as it's going down, so you can image the peristalsis of, of the gut motion, and you can image all the way you know, through your uh, a digestive tract. Um, it's not fun though. Uh, the other, the contrast agent that's more interesting to us is the liquid iodinated contrast agent, say something like, a uh, trade name is Isoview, and uh, it has a lot of iodine in it, and the, as we said before, this catheter is usually inserted into your femoral artery and then pushed up your descending coronary artery and around the arch to plug in to one of the two coronary arteries coming off your aorta, either the left main or the right coronary artery. And then and that produces that amazing picture and movie that we just saw. Um, we look for areas of narrowing. Those basically the, you know, significant coronary stenosis. Um, I think we might... I don't know what this is. Oh, okay, so here's the geometry of, you know, the, the femoral artery, and then this is where the, the two femoral arteries branch off, comes up. And then usually the catheter itself, this is a guide wire, and then the catheter comes over top of the guide wire, you pull the guide wire back and the catheter remains in the root of the aorta. And these catheters come in different shapes. So they have different curls on their end. And depending on the, the size of the patient and which coronary artery you want and how difficult it is to engage that coronary artery, you want to stick the end of this thing right into the ostium, but not too far. Right, you don't want to stick it all the way down there, just in the ostium, such that when you inject the dye, not much dye is lost into the aorta, but most of it goes down in here. And one of the difficulties, one of the complications that can occur in this procedure is this uh, end of this catheter can cause a slight tear 
in the coronary artery and you can what's called get a dissection and the, where the wall of the artery kind of peels away and then that's a that's not a good situation you have to do some kind of emergent procedure either put a stent to get rid of the tear push it back to the wall or you know if, if you've really screwed it up you would need to do uh, surgery and put a bypass to the vessel luckily when it happens you're sitting there with all these physicians there and the surgery is is just up the hall right and coronary catheterization up until I guess 15 years ago or something required that a surgical uh, let an OR was on standby right to for these complications and so that really tamped down the number of procedures that could be done because you had to have a, one an OR in your hospital two you had to have it on standby right so that after years and years of low risk um, procedures being done, they, that was taken off the table. You don't have to have a surgery on standby. Uh, so many, many more procedures are done. And so here are just a, a rogues gallery of shapes that these uh, catheters come in, depending on what you want to do. Uh, which kind of vessels you want to engage, right? And, uh, you know, there, this is a Judkins, actually. I think there's a missing K there. Oh, oh, this is called a Judkins, and this is Jud Inns. Maybe that's just a pun, sorry. Um, but this guy, Judkins, was one of the original developers of catheterization. And interestingly, this was done by radiologists, and I think the first catheterizations that they did, they kind of did on themselves. <laughs> it's like, wow, I'll stick it up there and squirt the stuff in. So uh, that was before IRBs and things like that. But So now you, that this is what is in the packets hanging on the wall, and the, the interventionalist calls one of these down to do whatever kind of engagement they're trying to get done. Uh, you know, where, you know, if you wanted to plug into the right or the left coronary artery here and you had this curvature in this patient that would that would work well it can also come from the radial artery now which is in your wrist here so oftentimes they use a smaller catheter and it comes in from your wrist so they don't have to make a big uh, gash in a very large vessel in your leg um, so that's it's less invasive and you can recover more quickly um, but the catheter is usually smaller, and so the injection is less spectacular. Let's put it that way. The, the physician can inject, but less contrast actually goes in. Um, I'm not sure what I wanted to say about this, to tell you the truth. Just the fact that these curvatures need to be designed for particular um, uh, vessels. So here, uh, when you're looking at, at cath, it, it gets a little confusing as to which vessel is which, right? Because you can look at from many different angles. And so uh, if you're going to do research in this field where you're using x-ray images, you do want to memorize this table, which is what is the viewpoint uh, of uh, a particular picture. So if my patient is on the table here, my x-ray source is under the patient and my detector is above my image, I'm looking down through the detector, okay? Like that. When the x-ray source is over here underneath the patient's left arm and my detector is over here just above the patient's right arm, right? Uh, this is called an RAO positive view, so I'm over top of the uh, patient here, or LAO negative. And um, right 60 degrees, I don't know what the AO, what we're talking about here. Uh, anterior oblique, I guess that, that means. Uh, this is a purely um, sort of transverse 
uh, or PA view it's called. It goes from the posterior to the anterior side or AP view. And then uh, this is an LAO view which is above the patient's, so your detector is above the patient's left arm. The reason you need to rotate around is so that the vessels that are overlapping each other in one view you can look at from a different view and, and see them in a non-overlapping format. The, uh, the secondary angles, these are the primary angles, and if you have a, a, uh, a DICOM file from a fluoroscopy system, it will give primary angle and secondary angle for the view uh, of that picture. Right? It will be in the header information. And it's this DICOM tag here. Uh, the secondary angle is whether or not the detector and, and source have been tilted towards the patient's head or towards the patient's feet. Okay? So this is, it's called a cranial view when you've tilted your view up towards the patient's head and you're looking down towards their feet, and a caudal view when you're, when you're towards their feet and looking up towards their head. And then again, this is just a simple AP view. So this is a set of views in a, a single patient uh, showing that you, know, you can angle uh, such that, say, this vessel and this vessel coming back here. This would be the circ going around here, and it's overlapping with this. You can get a view where they're pretty well independent from each other. However, in this view now, this LED and this vessel here at the junction are overlapped. Uh, so here you can find a view where you're looking from the caudal direction up and uh, they're not overlapped uh, anymore. So this is sort of more from the bot, from the apex of the heart up towards the, the base. Uh, and so normally about four views per vessel are taken, something like that. If you have two orthogonal views and you have a point that you can track, say this point here where this vessel comes off the main LED, so the LED is coming towards the apex here, and this is a perforating vessel down into the septum, that little crux there forms something that you can track actually across this field of view. So we can get its projection onto this plane and we know that motion. What we don't know is the motion orthogonal to our plane. So if you can see that same feature in a set of images that are say at 60 degrees to this image, you can then calculate the three-dimensional trajectory of that plane. Uh, that is done for some applications uh, with fluoroscopy, but not many. Okay, they, it's very rarely done actually that people track these things in 3D. People just look at them. So like 99% of, of uh, images like this are purely the, the physician looks at them and makes a call as to what the disease is. And so here's uh, one particular view, this looks like, I don't know which view this is. This looks like an LAO cranial probably. This is the spine, right? So we're looking from over to the left side down towards the patient. And the question is, so when we're looking at this and trying to make a diagnosis is like, if you look down these vessels, as that injection is occurring, are, do any of them have a critical stenosis? Right? And so all the vessels in the field of view seem to be okay in this view. Perhaps, you know, if you look up here, as that thing just comes in and out of overlap, there might be a stenosis up there. Right? But on this view, they look pretty good. So we take a different angle and bingo, there you can see that, one, this uh, vessel is filling late, right? So you watch, this one fills really rapidly and that one fills quite late. So that means the flow is a little slower in here. Two, 
it gets quite dim. It doesn't, you know, it's not a 90% reduction in diameter or anything. However, it does show that the shadow itself is not as dark. And so that means that the amount of vessel in the through plane direction is also less. So it's narrower in the plane that's orthogonal to our viewing plane here. And it obviously has some kind of narrowing uh, right, you know, right at the, at that point right there. So this is an abnormal vessel. But the question is, is that vessel, is that abnormality significant hemodynamically? Like, is it going to reduce this patient's blood flow such that they would have an infarct or something downstream from this? And so that, that's the open question, right? And um, what we can do, since the patient's in the cath lab, is you can remember, put a pressure catheter here at the, either in the aorta or at the proximal part of the artery and, in, and measure the pressure trace here and then measure the pressure trace distal to this observable lesion and look at the, for the difference in those pressures. And if that difference is high, then that is a significant lesion. So that takes something from a visual standpoint to a functional standpoint. And this is an essential part of fluoroscopy, x-ray fluoroscopy these days, is making that measurement. Right? For a physician to look at this and say, I'm going to treat this vessel just based on this image, that doesn't really fly anymore in, for this picture. Because right? you don't really know what the percentage stenosis is there. We happen to have CT of that vessel uh, in this patient. So we see it is the LAD that has that dark lesion here. Uh, and so we can see as it's moving, you know, here's the proximal brightness, it goes dark, and then there's brightness again. On the CT, if we look at the intensity of the image right through the lesion there, that's this blue field of view, you can see that there, the vessel is really dim. It's actually quite dark. And so the fact that it's so much dimmer than, than what contrast-filled vessels should look like is an indication that, that that thing is a seriously stenotic lesion. You can, with the CT, as we discussed before, segment out the vascular tree itself and then run a simulation using computational fluid dynamics of the flow of blood down this vascular tree under the assumption that you know the volume into which that blood is going. And that's usually modeled from the myocardial mass. And when you do that, this process predicts that there will be a significant drop in pressure between this point and this point. This will be a 50% drop in pressure. Right? So that, if we recall back to FFR in the cath lab, remember anything greater than a 20% drop was the indication that you should, in fact, intervene and put a stent in this, uh, in this vessel. And so, uh, you know, the CT, interestingly enough, at this point would predict that this person should go to the cath lab and get a stent put in there. Okay, and interestingly on the, from my perspective, interestingly, on the cath itself, without the FFR, it would be a hard call right, to know whether or not that thing is really significant. Uh, another thing that, be, that can be done in fluoroscopy is uh, a retrograde venogram. And that means you inject contrast, you put a catheter down the vein in, in the heart. So there's a very large cardiac vein, as you can see it here, and it drains right into the uh, uh, right atrium. And um, uh, you can put a catheter down that vein, squirt dye into it, and see where the veins you know, or, uh, and this is helpful if you want to use this very large tube and trajectory to 
to get somewhere in the heart. And so when you're doing an intervention with a catheter, say putting a, a new pacing lead in the heart, uh, you can actually go with that catheter down these veins and, and place your device uh, using the, the trajectory that on, on the surface of the heart that is inside the veins. So that's, that's actually done for placing pacing catheters often now. If you want to place them on the surface of the, of the ventricle. And then another thing that fluoroscopy is used, is becoming more and more commonly used for, is to place aortic valves. And um, you can, if, if the patient has, you know, a highly calcified and non-functioning valve, and so that it can't open and you have a very high pressure gradient across the valve, you really want to open that thing up and uh, put a new valve in there. And so you can do it surgically. You can crack the patient's chest, you know, stop the heart, go to the aortic root, cut out the old valve, put, sew in a new valve. And that's, that is a successful surgery and it's been with us for a long time. But using fluoroscopy, using imaging, you can also now take a large catheter, bring it uh, up the descending aorta around the arch, and then line it up with the aortic valve, push across the aortic valve, and then deliver, that's inside this very large catheter, an expanding valve. So it's like a, it's like a large stent that has valve leaflets inside it. Right? And this is called uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR. Uh, this way of doing valve replacement is, as we sit here, it's growing exponentially, right, over time. And so, you know, you basically, you double the number of people that are getting this procedure done every year for the last 10 years or something. So we're up to tens of thousands getting this procedure done now. Um, it's terrific in the sense you don't crack the patient's chest. You put the valve in essentially minimally invasively. You open up this, you hope, and so there's little tines on the valve that stop it from shooting up the aorta, and you size it so that it fills this gap, and there isn't a, any kind of flow around the valve. Uh, and then when you pull back your hardware, the, the patient is left with a functioning valve, and that occurred in a few minutes, right? And so it's, it's a really nice uh, for sort of development. And this is what bioengineering should do, right, is make things like this, right, so that people don't have to get their chest cracked. They just go in, and then literally that afternoon, they're walking around with a new valve, right? And so this is what the fluoro looks like as that uh, valve is being placed in there. This is a echo probe um, that's, uh, you know, making... Uh, echo images of this valve that's being inflated. You can see they're, they're pulling back the sheath and there's this cage here which is the valve itself. It has the valve leaflets and um, this is transesophageal echo so this echo probe is down the patient's esophagus and looking up towards the heart to make the pictures during the, the insertion. And you can see the size of the catheter that delivers the valve. It's pretty big. Right? but they're, they're being made smaller. Right. Okay, uh, there, I put a table in here, which is, for your benefit, which is the summary of how much dose is given to the patient. And this, this data is probably, it's, it's from 2014, so the data itself would be probably from 2012 or something like that. All of these things are changing dynamically as CT and SPECT and everybody tries to push the dose down. But here are the, you know, the round numbers for what the dose to the patient is for, for different procedures. And you can see that fluoroscopy TAVR, which is what we just looked at, 12 to 23 millisieverts. If you, that's from a transapical approach. From a transfemoral approach, which is what we just looked at with that catheter, is 33 to 100 millisieverts for the patient, right? So there's a lot of radiation gets in there. However, for that patient, they're usually in their 70s, and radiation dose is not their big problem right now. Uh, but if you look at coronary 
CT coronary angiography with perspective triggering, we're down to about a half a millisievert to five millisieverts, depending on the size of the patient. Um, technetium cestin, maybe this is stress testing with SPECT. You know, we're in the tens, 10 to 20 millisieverts uh, for those. And so basically in the dose race, I think the CT is going to win that uh, by a long stretch. And so here's, this is what we started out with, with our estimates of spatial resolution for all these techniques, but I updated this. Uh, to do echocardiography, what's the imaging time is, you know, we're going pretty fast, like 30 frames a second is a simple echo, 2D echo, echo study. The voxel dimensions, somewhere on this order, probably is reasonable, although we saw that it changes with depth. Uh, the total imaging volume looks like this. Um, SPECT imaging time is very long, 10 minutes, very low spatial resolution uh, because of the low resolution of the detectors and the few number of photons that are detected. Uh, you know, the very large voxel volume, right? Uh, you can break a heartbeat up into 10 phases and, and produce those. Computed tomography, about 140 milliseconds, round numbers, imaging time. Ridiculously high resolution in 3D, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.65. Uh, and then MR, we're looking at about 10 seconds for a 2D image, probably three minutes for some kind of 3D volume. Resolution, order of magnitude larger. Uh, than or a voxel volume that's you know almost two orders of magnitude larger than CT, uh, but if you get many many heartbeats that are the same, you can achieve a display a, you know a frame rate that's high. You could do that here, however, here you have to worry about dose on CT, and so you can't just infinitely take images with CT. Right, you're eventually going to run into dose issues. But the same view sharing that's done down here could be done in CT, right? X-ray angiography, ridiculously fast imaging time, very good spatial resolution, but it's a projection uh, and a very small imaging volume for that. Uh, and here's and the display rates can you know go up to 30 frames a second, so very fast. And remember, the image itself is is detected in a super fast. Uh, shutter speed. So that's why it's so clear. Okay, so that that wraps it up, wraps up the course. And so, you know, our, our idea was how are we going to image uh, somebody's heart such that we can characterize what severity of disease they have, whether it's a drop in flow or dead tissue or uh, electrically abnormal tissue. A lot of it pulled back to looking at the geometry of the vessel itself, whether or not that thing was narrowed. Uh, the best way to do that was CT and X-ray uh, for, for the geometry. Echo gave us awesome function at the bedside. Like you can just put an echo probe on a patient, and this is why they're done all the time. Somebody comes in with chest pain, one of the first things they do is just grab an echo probe and put it on the heart and see what's happening. And so it's it's in your hand, it's ready to go, and in fact now echo systems are made such that the, the transducer is a separate unit and you can look at it on your iPhone. Right? So SPECT and PET, functional significance, like is the perfusion down is the, is the principal question there. If I have a 1 cc of tissue, what's the absolute blood flow in that 1 cc of tissue? And PET is probably the best way to do that, PET and MR. SPECT gives you these, these really low resolution pictures, but if you're really sick and there's a huge chunk of your heart missing on the SPECT, you're probably, you know, ha have a significant lesion. It's highly probable you have a significant lesion. So that data is useful. MR, you know, you, there's a dozen things you can do with MR, and we looked at a few of those. We can look at flow of blood, you can look at myocardial function. You can look at perfusion by looking at contrast agent dynamics as we inject a contrast agent. And we can do tagging to get ridiculously high resolution mechanics. Right? 
Um, so that's the whole suite of tools that we looked at. There's a few other things we didn't look at, such as intravascular ultrasound. We have a catheter with an ultrasound probe on it, so you can actually look at the inside of the vessel. Intravascular OCT, or optical coherence tomography, where you're using light, and it's a, and it's a spinning uh, detector to look at, at the vessel walls on, on a catheter. Um, and so those, those are, are also used, but we didn't really have time to go into them. Okay, so uh, we'll cover every, on the test on Thursday, we're going to cover everything from our last quiz, what was on the last quiz up to today. Okay, and um, we'll, we'll use the whole time on Thursday uh, to do that. I will email, I'm sorry about the bad instructions about the course uh, website for, for, for rating the course. It would be great if you would do it because specifically